Good evening and welcome to this discussion and a little bit later a performance of the sixth solo cello suite of Bach on five string viola. Because of COVID-19 restrictions, I'm coming to you from my office right to your living room. Uh, second best, but we'll make it work. Glad you're along for this ride. I'm going to share my screen, uh, some things that I think will be of value and interest as we go through this discussion. A certain amount of mystery surrounds the cello suites by Bach, and especially the sixth suite. I hope you won't be too disappointed to learn that I will not be making any earth-shattering pronouncements about these mysteries, though I might sprinkle in an opinion here or there. A hundred years of exploration uh, have been devoted to these questions by folks with much more musicological savvy than I will ever have. So I won't say anything that will further prove my ignorance. For me, while these mysteries are fascinating, it's all about the music. Of the six suites, the sixth is to me the most engaging, the most poignant, the most joyful. And we can't ignore the sixth suite because of that music. No matter what problems we might encounter, we've got to get through it because the music is so fabulous. First, a little history. It is generally assumed that Bach composed his six suites for unaccompanied cello around the time that he composed his six sonatas and partitas for solo violin, or around 1720. Alas, there is no such set of pieces for solo viola. Therefore, we slightly more than jealous viola players borrow from both sets. The notes a viola is capable of playing lies between those of the violin and the cello. So to play these violin or cello pieces on a viola is not a perfect match. Here are the open strings of, of the three instruments. To play the violin sonatas and partitas on viola requires a viola player to play in a different key than the original key, down the interval of a fifth. While Bach didn't seem to mind hearing his music performed uh, in keys other than those originally intended, and also didn't seem to mind hearing his music performed by instruments other than those originally intended, Playing these violin pieces on viola does change the timbre, the mood, and the brilliance of the original. And so it goes for viola players who play the cello suites. The timbre, mood, and brilliance of the original all change when played on viola. However, playing the cello suites on the viola does not require a change of key since the viola and cello are tuned exactly one octave apart. Because of this fact, violists play the cello suites unabashedly. And in fact, the first five cello suites are some of the most regularly assigned by teachers and performed pieces in the viola repertoire. To say that viola players are grateful for these pieces is to understate the matter considerably. Movements of Bach are often required for violists auditioning for schools and even occasionally for orchestra positions and movements of the cello suites are chosen much more frequently than the violin movements for such purposes. The original manuscript of these pieces is lost. The closest we have to an original manuscript is a copy in, of the music in the handwriting of Bach's second wife, Anna Magdalena Bach. I enjoy imagining that Bach spilled his beloved coffee on the original and Anna Magdalena was conscripted to come up with a new version. I actually have a little drawing of the happy couple, uh, perhaps playing the music her husband composed for her at the table, music which is no doubt familiar to our keyboard, uh, listening, keyboard playing listeners. You may have noticed a moment ago that I didn't say all six suites are commonly performed by violists. The reason? The sixth suite was composed for a bass instrument with five strings instead of four, which brings us to mystery number one, for what instrument did Bach compose this piece? Once again, here is the title page of all six suites. That's a great question. The Anna Magdalena Bach version, which I will henceforth refer to as the AMB version, 
makes no reference to any particular instrument that should be used for the sixth suite. Perhaps Bach did not want to identify a particular instrument, believing it was just fine to play the piece on whatever five-stringed instrument you happen to have lying around. The title page that you see there only calls for a violoncello, the formal name of what we refer to as a cello these days. The title page is in French, perhaps in honor of the French-style dance movements that comprise the suites. You'll notice that at the bottom of the title page refers to Bach as Master of the Chapel. Most scholars believe these pieces were composed while Bach was employed in a court position in Curtin, but this particular copy would have been done later, while Bach was enjoying his longtime position as Master of the Chapel at St. Thomas Church in Leipzig. Further, the first page of the sixth suite does not indicate a particular instrument other than to alert us about the fifth string and also how the five strings are to be tuned, which you can see at the top of the page here. The fifth string is added on the high end, not the low, giving the instrument a higher range. In the 1720s, there would have been much wider variation in stringed instruments and more frequent use of instruments that might be considered oddities today. A five-string cello could have been constructed requiring a wider neck and five peg peg box. Here's a photo of my instrument on the right and the five string instrument on the left. You will notice that even though the instrument on the left is actually smaller, the neck is uh, considerably wider. And of course, you'll notice the number, the different number of strings and pegs. Historians make mention of three other possible instruments for which the sixth suite could have been composed if not a five-string cello. Each of these three instruments is rarely seen these days. Included on this list is the viola pomposa. I think we may eliminate this uh, instrument from possibility. The strings of the viola pomposa were tuned identically to the instrument I will be playing uh, this evening, meaning it could not play low enough to perform the notes of the piece as originally scored. Also, uh, the earliest mention of the viola pomposa historically comes from 1725, a few years after the cello suites were supposed to have been uh, composed. A likely possibility is the violoncello piccolo. This is a slightly smaller cello, roughly 7 8 size, with a fifth string tuned exactly as in the sixth suite. We know that Bach had a violoncello piccolo made for him by a luthier in Leipzig, with an indication that he liked the sound and the possibilities of the instrument. But again, the violoncello piccolo is not listed as the instrument of choice in this edition of the piece. You might ask, yes, but did Bach ever specify the violoncello piccolo as the instrument of choice in any of his pieces? And the answer to that is yes, in several of his cantatas, but not here. The final possibility is an instrument known as the violoncello da spalla. When I was younger, I remember seeing paintings like this and thinking, what a terrible painter. That's not how a violin is played. Well, uh, now consider the violoncello da spalla. So there you have it, played just like in that uh, painting from so many years ago. This is a five string instrument, larger than a viola but smaller than a cello obviously, and tuned identically to the specifications of the sixth suite. It is held in place by a strap around the neck and shoulders of the player and the tailpiece of the instrument. As an interesting side note, one of the possible uses of this instrument was to have a bass stringed instrument that could be used in a marching ensemble, believe it or not, bringing to mind for me Woody Allen's hilarious depiction of the marching cello in the movie Take the Money and Run. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to be able to prove that any one of these three, the violoncello piccolo, the violoncello di spalla, or the cello constructed for five strings, 
was Bach's instrument of choice for the sixth suite. Modern cellists are able to play the suite with four swing strings, and even though that's not what Bach intended for reasons I'll be discussing shortly, it works well in the hands of a fine player who is able to extend the range of a cello by playing in high positions much more easily than violists can. So what do violas do with the suite? Consider this quote on the issue from the preeminent viola champion, <coughs> there we go, William Primrose, who wrote, I have chosen not to edit the, uh, the sixth of the box suites for cello because I find it totally unsuited to the viola. Heaven knows it is also unsuited to the former instrument in its four string format, except when performed by a very few of the elite. The burdens it places on the average cellist are just too grim and the outcome of the struggle is predictable while arousing Aristotelian terror and pity in the beholder and the listener. No, so far as the viola is concerned, it is imprudent to attempt it, for the results are usually deplorable. If many arbitrary and abrupt changes of character are to be avoided, the player has to ascend into the unforgiving upper reaches of the viola, an instrument meant for but brief forays into that region. It is all rather a pity, as the work is one of the noblest of Bach's creations and of a scope and inventive genius that is awesome. So we violas are well advised to leave the task to the cellists, and only to a few of them would I give ear. Primrose's own version of the Bach suites skips the sixth suite altogether. However, over the years, many viola players have created versions of the suite for a four-string viola, though each must make significant changes to the music. To make it possible. This is the, these are the, this is the range uh, which is a, a required by this, uh, this piece. It's in three octaves and a fifth, eliminating the possibility that a violic player could ever play the piece as intended on a four-stringed instrument in the original key. However, as mentioned earlier, the music is incredible and plenty of viola players have made versions of this piece that could be played on a four-string uh, viola, choosing one of two options. First, leave the music in D major and make adjustments down an octave when the notes get too high. Or second, change the key to G major, moving it down a fifth, which calls for octave adjustments whenever the music gets too low. These two examples are from a version for which I have uh, much respect, the Watson Forbes edition of the Bach Suites for viola. And uh, he chose to change the key of the piece to G from D, which means that he has to make oct oct octave adjustments. What you see there, this is the uh, this is our edition, and which which I took just from the Anna Magdalena Bach or the AMB version. And you see this uh, these two arrows here and there are changed because of necessity in Forbes' issue. Uh, he made these notes; he had to raise them up an octave because to bring them in their lowest original form, of course, is, in, is not possible. Another one, this is the also the Forbes edition. If you see in the bottom example here, the notes of this ascending arpeggio go up a little further before going down, and he very cleverly brings it down uh, earlier, and it makes the effect that it ends up one octave lower than was originally intended. This is, this is one of the things that many of the, the writers did, is they did these things very cleverly, and that uh, people who play the four string versions without studying the original probably have no idea where the melody takes twists and turns that Bach did not necessarily expect. And so many of these versions have done very well to keep the music Bach-like. But problems arise from more than merely range. For instance, the, the music of the first movement calls for the wonder, uh, this, this wonderful little uh, germ of an idea uh, that involves playing the same note twice in a row, once with a finger down on the strings, or what we call stopped, and immediately after on an open string, what we call open string, without any fingers down. So here's the stopped first note, and here's the open. So, so that's the idea. So the first two measures sound like this.
So it's very, I mean, that's one of his main ideas of the entire first movement. If we have a five string instrument, we have four different combinations that we can use of those back to back. So in measure 12, we have the same thing here. And then in measure 54. And then finally, a little differently, but still we have this idea of a little bit different melody in measure 24. With a four string instrument, of course, there are only three possibilities of combinations for adjacent strings. So writers writing for a four string instrument would need to get creative to make the germ feel similar. Here are some ways that that has happened. You'll see in the upper left Watson Forbes edition uh, changes octaves there to mimic the idea of the, of the string crossing. Uh, both uh, Watson Forbes and Simon Roland Jones, another fabulous edition, uh, of, of the suites. And Roland Jones actually made two versions, one for five string viola and one for four string. And so he does basically the same idea as Forbes, uh, slightly differently. And then in the bottom uh, with, uh, with Leonard Davis, he, his edition calls for uh, this, for the final one, it just sounds a little bit different. <laughs> And he uses the change of bow to mimic the change of string from the two, the two similar notes. Over the last 10 years, I've created my own edition of the first five cello suites. But because I agree with William Primrose, I have not attempted to add the sixth suite until now. About this time last year, I received word that I had won a grant that would pay for the purchase of a five string viola. The viola used in the performance was provided to the university thanks to a gift from the Constance Miriam Seifert and Ethel Corinne Seifert Memorial Fund, which supports faculty research. I'm extremely grateful for this gift. I'm pleased to announce that this instrument will become a permanent part of the viola studio here at the University of Nebraska, allowing students wishing to play the sixth suite to have the proper equipment. Tonight's performance will be the first time the instrument will be heard in a public concert after arriving in town in June. The instrument was made in China for Eastman strings and came to the violin shop of Lincoln without a bridge or tailpiece or pegs or strings. And David Frederick of the violin shop finished the instrument and kindly provided a case uh, for the instrument as well. David also helped me find workable strings to use the instrument is longer than a violin, and the strings must be longer than violin strings. The problem is E string is a violin string. So he helped me find an E string that was long enough and well, would, so that the winding of the instrument would not uh, go over the edge. See, my finger would go in this region, the lowest finger, and so it's undesirable to have the winding, which you see in the other strings, well into the peg box. Here it comes over. So we had to find an E string that worked in that case. Okay, so now it would seem that having a five stringed instrument in my hands means all the problems with the six suite would just go away. I mean, you buy the score, you play the music on the page. What could be easier, right? Which brings us to mystery number two. What notes shall we play? Because we don't have the original box score, we are forced to look at the early versions of the piece. The earliest and the one closest to the non-existent original is the aforementioned AMB version. After some reading on the topic, I've made the decision not to take into account the other three early versions. There are differences between the AMB, AMB version and the others, and some changes suggested in those early versions vary from the AMB versions in notable ways. David Yearsley, in a book about Anna Magdalena Bach, refers to her as a talented calligrapher and a careful copyist. In my opinion, deciding Anna Magdalena copied numerous wrong notes into her score is at best an interesting decision and at worst an arrogant one. After all, by deciding that Anna Magdalena Bach is wrong, you might be deciding that Johann Sebastian Bach is wrong, and that is quite an assertion. 
Before I give you some examples, let me tell you about Alex Clausen. Alex is a former viola student of mine here at UNL. He has since gone on to bigger and better things, uh, studying and teaching in our modern languages department at the university. He has been involved in the Bach project since the beginning, or around 2010. He has given me a blank slate, so to speak. He provided me with just the notes of each suite without any other notation. And then it was his job to decipher my edits and to keep up with my changes of mind and my mistakes. I can't thank him enough uh, for all his work. Let's take a look at some of the interesting uh, issues revolving notational problems. From the Courant movement, which Alex called in the latest edition the Courantine movement, and I made him keep it, seems to fit, don't you think? The left column in all, ex all three examples showed the music found in measures 22 and 23. This is, of course, Anna Magdalena's box handwriting here, Simon Roland Jones, and the Potter edition. All of those three in this column line up. They are exactly as written by her. In the right column, however, you see that uh, Roland Jones took some liberties with the second time the same melody came back, took some liberties with it. And you see by the arrows where those notes differ slightly. In the bottom, the bottom right, uh, Alex and my edition, uh, show the, uh, with the arrows point to the differences, my version matches on a Magdalena box. And then also in beat two of that second measure within the brackets, you'll see that Roland Jones made the change in that beat to match what is over here. And I'm less inclined to make a, a jump like that, I guess you could say. The same thing happened in the jig. So on the left, we see these two columns, and you see her original, and we're really talking about this section right here, which is duplicated both in the Watson Forbes edition and in uh, our edition. But the next time this melody comes back in measures 17 and 18, she doesn't have this exact thing, changes it a little bit, and you can see that Watson Forb changed his to match this over here. Well, I did what I could to retain uh, the original. Let me play these for you. I'll first play the notes of the bottom left. and the bottom right. But Forbes decided to change that uh, uh, to match what was on the left. Of course, it's not unbach like There's nothing about it that sends people running away. It's just that I chose not to make changes like that in her manuscript. And it's very likely that uh, Roland Jones and Watson Forbes may have been working from other earlier editions that, that made the changes from the AMB original. In the Jig measures 11, 12, this one's particularly perplexing to me. Uh, in several editions of the piece, and I might add in several prominent recordings by prominent cellists, the last note of measure 11 is changed to a G sharp. And as you can see, there's no such mark here for her. Uh, the G-sharp change doesn't occur to over here, which is, of course, in this version and my version. So that note is changed. And these two notes, really, that G-sharp and then this one. And I, um, it changes the piece drastically. When this melody comes back in the second half of the piece, you do see uh, this, this note is raised, but in the opening it's not. And again, uh, that's, a, that's a jump I'm not uh, willing to make. However, there is one jump that I'm willing to make. I actually believe that Anna Magdalena Bach may have made a mistake in the jig in measure 38. The note that you see with the uh, arrows is the note that's in question. So let me play for you. This is a, a, a two-octave idea that then is echoed immediately. Here's how it appears in the opening of the whole piece. So it's this wonderful little tune. 
In the second half, it appears, it comes back, but this time in minor. But those aren't the notes that she wrote. She wrote. And I think that that note in question, she intended the B and not the D, uh, which you see. This note, is, there's a bit too much repetition. So if you break down that melody, it's just in the echo. And if we left it the way she did it, so I and every other person who've ever made an addition of this makes that change. So that's the only place where I have changed anything um, of, of, in terms of notes from the uh, original AMB version. So notes are an issue, but probably not the biggest issue when making uh, your own addition. So finally, mystery number three, how should we bow the piece? The big issue is bowing. Bowing is the reason so many editions of this piece are on the market. That's why there's a Potter edition, if you will, on the market. Well, it's not on the market yet, but maybe somebody will want this. Bowing revolves around two primary issues. How many notes are played in one bow stroke and the resulting articulation? For those of you who are not string players, I uh, just want to explain this very, very briefly. Consider a few of the ways that, uh, that seven notes could be played. <laughs> Of course, there's nearly a countless uh, number of ways to, to play those seven notes. But you can see that the arced line, this indicate we call those a slur for string players. And the slur tells us what notes are to be played in a single bow stroke. In this case, six. In this case, every note has its own bow stroke. In this case, three, etc. So almost all of the scholars who have studied this music of Anna Magdalena Bach agree that the bowings in the score are inconsistent, which makes it difficult to know what Bach might have wanted. The examples I will show you will help you understand and give clues as to how I made my decisions. As any of you understand, if you've signed your name to anything you've created, you want to be able to stand by your work. I took great care with my bowing decisions. I strove for consistency and did my best to make musical sense. Will everyone like them or agree? No, and that's okay. I came up with a version I like and can live with. And since music is alive, I suspect I'll be changing my mind over the years. This first example from the Jig. Oh, let me interrupt myself and say, before I go on to this, I have to say that I'm not sure Bach would really care that the pieces bowed the same way every time, in fact, I rather doubt it. Also, I'm guessing he would be impressed by those who could expertly play the sixth suite on a four string instrument. And third, I gave the AMB version my complete respect and based my edition of the cello suites on the AMB version. I hope that my opinions honor the spirit of her markings and I also had some fun with it. One of the places where I had the most fun was in the jig. As you've already learned, Many people get hung up if a, a melody is done one way in one part of the piece and not done the same way in another, in another part. Here's my favorite example. This is one where I'm driving a stake into the ground and planting my feet firmly and saying, I'm not taking this away. I rather like the fact that the two don't match. And I wonder why others so easily change the original. First, look at the second beat of the bracketed version. See here in the Anna Magdalena Bach that there's clearly a slur over those notes. Most people agree that that is over all six notes. Uh, here in the Roman Jones version, instead of over all six, it's bowed in twos like all the music around it. Let me show you the difference here. It goes like that. So if you're doing this in twos, which is fine, and that's how it is later in the piece, 
but the first time it's different. All six are played in one bow stroke. And I like that difference. I, I'm very fond of that change. Of course, I wish it was that way the second time. And I'd love to change the second time to match this, but that might go against the spirit of what I'm trying to do here. Next, we'll look at seven measures of the jig through show, oh, oops, nope, not quite yet, sorry. So in this one, we see that uh, measures 83 and 84. So I'm just so showing you seven measures of the jig to show how many decisions had to be made in such a short amount of time. So in this example, You'll see here, uh, this is merely a rewriting of the Anna Magdalena box, so you can see, see it easily enough. We have these five descending little mini scales, and in the last two, those don't have any slurs. They're marked separate. I and many people who've made, had to make decisions like this slur all of them. So all five, they slur all six notes in. Um, and that's what I've done below. I changed that to reflect the same idea. Uh, also here, in the next one from the next two measures, we see four different ascending arpeggios. They go up and then down. There are four of these. Here's two, here's three, and four. You'll see that in the last three of these, the first six notes are detached and the next six are in a slur. In the first group of four, she reversed those. The first six are in a slur, and the next six are in uh, separate bows. Well, I decided to make it all uniform, and the way that I did it was to have the first six of each group to be played without slurs, and then the second half to have the slurs. For some reason, many, many additions decide that all of these should have slurs, okay? Even though she, in my opinion, made it fairly clear that not both the ascending and the descending arpeggio should be, should be uh, bowed uh, in one bow. And finally, one that maybe is the most fun with measures uh, 85, uh, excuse me, uh, in this next example, this is the opening of the quarantine, and it shows a particular rhythm, which I'll show you here in the first full measure. This is also up here, of course, I'm just giving you a slightly easier version to read, hopefully. Eighth note, two sixteenths, and four eighth notes. That particular rhythm happens five times in the first six measures. In the original, as you see these, there's only one measure which uses a slur at all. The others, no slur, no slur, no slur. And obviously in the first one, no slur. So I've chosen to do all of those measures without a slur, every note detached. Sounds like this. But then you'll notice a few bars later, we have this same rhythm happening three times in a row, right here, and right here, and right there. And in each of these cases, she uses a slur of some kind. Now, if you look closer, this slur kind of looks like it's over two notes, right? This one could be construed that it's most of the measure except maybe the last note. This one looks like the first four notes of the measure would be under one slur. This is part of the problem with the Boeings and the AMB version. They're inconsistent. I would prefer that all of those um, be bowed the same way, but because she in included a slur in all of them, so did I. So in measures 9, 10, 11, I put a slur between the second, third, and fourth notes in each version, in each measure, pardon me. Here's what that sounds like. So I'll play, uh, I'll play the entire passage now with both that first time, we'll hear it separated, and the second time, we'll play it with slurs. That's a, a good example of the kinds of decisions that had to be made, literally hundreds of them, um, throughout this piece. In conclusion, I'd just like to uh, 
in spite of the various difficulties, unsolvable mysteries, the challenges of getting my hand on a five string viola and then learning to play the darn thing, I repeat that all of this is worth it. The piece is worth the effort. It's that fabulous. I dare to throw my edition into the pile of the others, not pretending that it's the best or any better than the wonderful versions that have preceded mine. But to me, and to hopefully my students, my version has tremendous value. I'd like to thank those of you, those people who have been such a help along the way. Of course, Alex Clausen, the Seifert Memorial Fund, Cameron Shoemaker's tremendous help to me technologically with everything that we've had to do. These people uh, made it so much easier for me and some of my students helping me with technology too, and I'm not the greatest at. So my, my sincere thanks. Now, none of this matters if you don't hear the music, so I hope you enjoy the performance. Thank you very much.
Thank you. 